the method of marketing is you're really putting yourself in the shoes of who is searching and why, as opposed to disrupting someone's scroll. Why are they searching what they're searching? Also, what are they searching? And then what do they want to see? How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the Ecom Unleashed podcast. I've got a special guest here for you. Welcome, Nick. How you doing, Nick? Going well, man. Nice to finally chat with you. you But yeah. Good yeah, we've been going back. We've just gone back and forth over the years. <laughs> I'll give it everyone a quick rundown on who you are. So Nick is the founder of Arminus Digital. Is it Arminus? Um, is that Arminus, Arminus. Honestly, man, it, it's Greek, so no one's going to get it right. Yeah. Arminus. Is it called Arminus? Arminus. Yeah, you got to roll that R. <laughs> All right. He's the founder of Arminus Digital. And after running several of his own online stores and then becoming one of the top performing category buyers of big companies such as Super Amart and BCF, he decided to delve into the service world to educate and manage up and coming e-commerce brands. And currently he's working with an exclusive handful of national and international e-commerce clients. Aminas Digital specializes in helping brands scale to the next level through the power of Google Ads, YouTube, and now Microsoft Bing. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually become popular again. Yeah. Woo. Awesome. Well, look, and he's he's also got a YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out yet, you need to go check it out. It's got a wealth of knowledge in there that teaches you everything from A to Z of Google Ads for free. I'm not going to lie. I've stolen a few things from you and I've learned a few tips and tricks from your YouTube channel, man. So everyone needs to jump on that ASAP. He's also got a Facebook group with over 7,000 members in it called Google Ads for e-commerce entrepreneurs and agency business owners. What a mouthful. <laughs> that's a gnarly one, but it says what it is. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, bro. Let's dig into your past a little bit. Get a bit of yeah. the scoop of the behind the scenes of who Nick is. Who were you in school, man? I was always quite, I was a bit of an extrovert, but I had like multiple friend groups. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. didn't, I had one core group of friends, but then I floated around in between different ones as well. I think I was like a bit of a funny guy. I played a lot of rugby, so I was always kind of on rugby league teams and stuff like that. I was good at all the heavy sports like shot put, hammer throw, all those sort of things because I was always, I've always just a big boy. Would you say there was any entrepreneurial tendencies at the time or not really? It was just kind of... Yeah, I think so. I think like my dad, he never really worked for people other than when he was really young. So I just, I grew up kind of seeing him do that and I always knew I didn't want to work for other people. I was pushed to get a good education though. So, you know, I went through uni and stuff like that. I actually studied law was my main thing, which is funny. So completely different to what I'm doing now. So I went completely down that road. But the main reason I went down that road was actually because a guidance counselor in high school said, oh, you don't have the grades to get into law. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to prove her wrong. I like proving people wrong with if they tell me I can't do something. So, but yeah, like I remember going on like camps in Greece because my dad's Greek. I lived in Greece when I was younger as well. And the Greek government used to pay for people to go and experience Greece. And I'd go on these camp trips and stuff and I'd just buy and sell stuff to people from other countries there. I was just always kind of wheel and deal, bought, sold. I've always had jobs from a young kid in retail selling, things like that. So I've always kind of had that. I can't believe you studied law. Did you get through it? Yeah, finished. Yeah, I've got the degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you a lawyer? No, I'm not a lawyer. I, ne I never did. So in Queensland, you have to do practical legal training, which is like your practical part. I never did that. I did a portion of it, but I never fully did it. So I'm not a lawyer, no. <laughs> yeah, wow. Is there anything you'd say that you've learnt along the way there, maybe studying or anything that kind of carried over into this next kind of marketing world? Yeah, I think communication, like really high level of communication skills. Like you learn some really, really... You, you learn how to get your point across with things like succinctly well, how to have well-reasoned arguments, negotiating, because a lot of things like if you're negotiating with suppliers and stuff like that, or with clients, whatever you might do, there's always some level of negotiation, whether or not you want there to be. So definitely negotiating. The one thing I think it did early in my career was it made me seem smarter than what I was. And I got into places just because I'd done law, which sounds ridiculous, but it actually was a thing like people would go, oh, you did law, you're now therefore qualified to do this, even though it was completely different. So it was funny that it just kind of, I don't know, it gave you like this leg up on people that hadn't done it, where it was like, well, he's done law, you know? And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense, but I'm gonna roll with it. That's so funny. Wow, yeah, yeah well, look, my 
arts degree did nothing for me. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up just doing whatever the heck I wanted. I was like, you know what? I'm going to study these random topics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how it went from there, but I, I, I finished, but I'd say I'm a dropout because I started studying to be a teacher because of the same reason you said the guidance counselor slash mom or whoever yeah, yeah, encouraged yeah. me. And I was like, hell no, my wife at the time, well, she's still my wife, but she said to me, <laughs> she's so are you really going to be a teacher? And I'm like, no, I don't know why I'm doing this. A whole new world opened up to me after that. Yep. I just wanted to invite you all to sign up to the first ever free AI powered e-commerce newsletter. <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, our new e-commerce unleashed newsletter is completely powered by AI. I know that is super duper exciting. <laughs> I'm pretty pumped if you didn't notice. The e-commerce landscape is changing rapidly. If you didn't know already, it's only going to move faster as AI gets smarter, technology advances, and the digital world merges more with ours and our customers' daily lives. I can't keep up with it. I hope you can keep up with it. <laughs> and that's pretty much why I launched this email. It's for anyone who is too busy to browse the internet, but also want to stay in the know when it comes to cutting edge e-commerce technology, the latest digital marketing strategies that are working for others, social media platform updates that happen pretty much every single day. Basically the most recent big news that will likely affect your e-commerce business. When you join up, it's completely free. The AI will just ask you a few questions to start to learn what you're interested in and what you're not interested in. And then you can start training it over time to show you the most relevant articles that you actually want to read. Also, the more people who join up, the better we'll get over time as well. How cool is that? So make sure that you spread the word and let's make this the most awesome tool for us all to use across the planet when it comes to e-commerce news. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Join up. It's completely free. Let's get back to the podcast. Sweet, man. So you went from studying law to opening stores or what, no. what's the transition? How does that work? So while I was at uni, I worked at BCF in their retail stores, so boating, camping, fishing. So they sell camping gear, kayaks, tents. It's kind of like for American people, Bass Pro, I guess would be the, the most similar thing. And I worked in those stores. I actually really enjoyed it. And I got a job offer in the head office as an assistant category manager, which is like basically category management is the people who decide what goes into these retail businesses. So they source the products, they negotiate with suppliers, they set pricing. They help with the marketing strategy. It's a really big, like all encompassing role. And it kind of gave me a really good foundation into like product sourcing and marketing. They're probably the two areas that it helped. And I eventually worked my way up through the ranks there. I was there for seven years in total. And like I got sent to China and countries and stuff like to source products. So I'd go to factories and like factories that like Walmart would use North Face, really, really big brands would use these factories and Super Retail Group had access to them because they're, they're all part of the same group. So like Super Cheap Auto, Rebel Sport and BCF, they're all part of that group. And I had a few other roles in that, but while I was doing that, I was just building up contacts for suppliers in China. And that's how I started my own stores. I would use those contacts to source products in China really, really cheaply. And that's kind of how I started the ball rolling. And then I got, you know, started looking into Shopify and things like that. It probably would have been around 2015, I'd say. And then, yeah, just started one, sold it, bought another, started another. And then eventually I just went, you know what? I'm kind of burnt out in doing this. I'm enjoying the marketing side, particularly Google. It just, Google just clicked with my brain. I'm not a creative. I'm very data driven, analytical. So anything creative like Facebook ads, I love them, but I hate them at the same time. It's just, it's just not me. You know, I'm not good at coming up with creative or copy or any of that sort of stuff. And Google, I just found so much easier to just, it just worked with how my brain works. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So super group, you leveraged your relationships in that. Yeah. I definitely recommend if for people who are thinking about jumping into their own business entrepreneur journey or whatever, seriously, look around and see what you've got right now as well. That's awesome, man. You climb the ranks, but you started doing this thing on the side and then eventually you kind of moved more yeah. into doing it for yourself. And then so transitioned away. So I, 
I kind of already knew that I was going to leave, but I, I don't know. It was just like mentally it was hard because I had a very high paying job. Like I had a really high six figure kind of like, it was a good job, paid good super, paid everything, paid bonuses. How and much like, were you paid? Were you I think me? I was paid around 160,000 plus. Holy super, dooly. Plus In 2015 bonuses. doing yeah, that, stuff, that was, that's awesome. I was 25 too. So that, I'm a 25 year old kid making really, really good money. And it was like, it was a bit of a struggle to leave, but I'll be honest, I had not replaced my income at that point, not even close, right? But I was just like, I had a really, really bad boss. I did not enjoy it there. I hated it. Every day I'd get up and I'd drive because I was on the Gold Coast and it was in Brisbane. I'd drive to Brisbane. I'd sit in traffic for, you know, an hour to an hour and a half each way. And then I'd go, there's got to be a bit more to life than this. The money's awesome, but I'm not enjoying this at all. That feeling just kept building and building and building and building. And to be honest, I've also always been a good saver. Like I'm not a person that no matter what income I've had, I've always saved a big portion of it. I'm not someone that goes and buys expensive cars or expensive clothes or anything like that. I'm the most low key person. I I enjoy food, like I really love food. I see a lot of meat stuff that you put up too, which is, (laughs) yeah, I like the meat. I'm a meat guy. You should join my meat barbecue crew. Yeah, like I've always, I had a good savings buffer. So I I reckon I would have, I would have had I bought a house at that point as well. So I had a mortgage. So that kind of was like, oh, do I want to leave a high paying job when I've got a mortgage? But I had a savings buffer. I probably had 80,000 in savings when I left. So I know a lot of people are scared because they don't have that buffer. But I mean, I personally needed it because I had a mortgage. I was worried. I probably could have done it earlier. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a fairly like risk averse person. I'm not a big risk taker. But um, in, in saying all this, like I would imagine you were hustling hard at the time because you had what yeah. a full-time job. You were earning 150, 160 grand a year or whatever. Plus then you're doing this side gig that eventually yeah. you want to transition to. That's a lesson to learn in itself. People don't need to quit their jobs. You suffered, you took the hit and you're like, yeah. I'm going to build a buffer. whilst I'm staying at my job. No, definitely. Like, I I think people feel like sometimes I hate this, therefore I have to quit. I think for most people, it's unrealistic. I think it's it's romanticized that, you know, you get to tell your boss to jam it and it's going to be all good. But then when you've got rent to pay or a mortgage or kids to feed or whatever it might be, it's just, it's irresponsible, I think, to just do that. Some, Some people will thrive, but I think most people will end up back at another job really quickly if they miss time that step. Yeah. The last guy I interviewed, Will, that'll mm-hmm. go up a bit before this. He literally quit. So that yeah. surprised, like I've never, I haven't heard many entrepreneurs who just went, "Hey, I'm done." They, yeah. but he did have a buffer as well. Same kind of thing. He went out. He didn't actually know what he was going to do next. Yeah, gotcha. which is the crazy thing. He's, like, I'm going to start researching after he quit. I'm like, holy yeah. man, you, 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 he went from a high paying job. He's got big yeah. balls to just say, see you later. Yeah. Like, holy dooly, man. But I'm in the same boat as you basically in the way that I see that transition stage. I think it's okay to keep it messy and just I think so. work at it. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the person. It depends on their age too. I think the younger you are, the less consequences there are if you just quit. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like where the older you are, you probably are going to have more responsibilities, more financial obligations, and yep. it's probably irresponsible to not kind of manage that transition well. But on the same token, I'm a risk averse person, so that's just my personality. Yeah, I'm more of a risk on person though there. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from Super Group. Yeah, so I probably didn't explain it well. So I worked, I went from Super Retail Group to another company called Ashdown Ingram, that's part of GPC Napa. It's an American company. It's basically like the super cheap auto of the US. So I worked in that for a very short period of time. I actually had really bad back during that point. And I kind of was like, oh man, my back is killing me. I'm hating this job. I'm just gonna take a little bit of time off. And in that time I took off, I got another job straight away. And it was at Amart Furniture. So also based in Brisbane. But it was kind of like a financial analyst role for buying and marketing. And that's kind of where I got even more exposure to like Google Analytics, marketing spend, things like that, that went to a higher level of detail and really high spend. These businesses are multi-billion dollar businesses. So it was even though I was doing small scale e-commerce stores, that really gave me confidence of, well, hold on a minute. A lot of these people are managing these multi-billion dollar companies. They haven't got a clue for the most part. I actually know more than them. I can do this on my own for myself. 2015, it probably took me two years to transition fully out of my job. 
And so it was late 2016 that I kind of went on my own. Yeah, wow. And look, mate, things would have changed since then too, right? In the whole Google Ads world, it's changed. I do. So give you a quick background. I'm actually a Google Ads noob. I don't know anything. You hit me with Facebook ads. I'm the creative guy with direct response marketing kind of yeah. guy, that world. I've never touched Google ads. I, I have touched it, but I've never been good at it. I chose my lane and it wasn't Google ads. So I'm yeah. super stoked to be able to try and ask you these questions because it's stuff I've always kind of had in the back of my head. Yeah. What's changed from the market? It was 2016, you said, to 2023. What are some of the bigger things in that Google ads kind of SEO? It's not SEO, is it? It's SEM. Yeah. SEM. Like search engine marketing. Yeah, yeah. Which SEO kind of falls into too. Yeah. Look, I think that a lot has changed and not much at the same time for Google. It's hard to explain, but to be honest, the basics of Google are still the same. Realistically, the reason more creative people don't get Google is the method of marketing is you're really putting yourself in the shoes of who is searching and why, as opposed to disrupting someone's scroll. So you're really trying to put yourself into the shoes of the person on the other device and why are they searching what they're searching? Also, what are they searching? And then what do they want to see? So it's really, really different to coming up with a nice creative to kind of get someone's attention, get them to convert, but there also are some similarities in getting them to convert. If someone is searching for something specific on Google, you need to make sure that your ad matches what they've searched and that your landing page or your product page gives them what they want and gets them to pull their wallet out. So like that, that side is still the same. If you treat it the same way as running Facebook ads, this is Google ads, it just doesn't work. There's no like really fast changes, like making lots of changes, changing things all the time is like probably the biggest downfall I see for Google ads advertisers. If I go into the account and I look at the change log and I see like, frequent changes i know that's why they're not doing well yeah <laughs> totally i'm learning so you. much and this is just like, I'm like okay yeah i need to i need to change who i am i need to be a new human <laughs> well, it's, just, it's just changing a mindset and i think like i i see a lot of people that are doing really really well with facebook ads wanting to add google on board and some of them get it but it's like my job is to build that trust with the person to go listen I know what I'm doing here. If you trust me, I can help you. It will take time. Yeah. But it will be different to what you're used to with Facebook ads because with Google, you can't just turn on a switch and then you're getting all these impressions and clicks and sales. It just doesn't work like that. Like sometimes it might take a week for a campaign even to just start getting impressions. Like it's just, it's just a really slow moving like aircraft carrier. Common thing I've seen with clients and people doing well with Google is that the people that have done work the best have been doing it the longest. That's what I've found. Okay. Like, and they've probably made the least number of changes and they've probably got the least complicated ad account structures. Like I think the whole segmenting this, doing that, it's nice, but I think it only is necessary for like maybe 1% of advertisers. Most people okay. need a really simple strategy to do well with Google. All right. You've literally rejigged a whole heap of mindsets that I've had about Google already, man. I was going to ask, why is it important for e-commerce brands to get this? Why should they invest their time, effort, and dollars into Google ads? Well, it's, there's probably two main reasons. One is where they're advertising at the moment, the Google buyer is probably not buying there. Do you know what I mean? Like a Google buyer is doing research or they want something really, really specific and they want it there and then, they're not going onto Facebook or Instagram or any place like that to buy it. And so I think every single brand has the opportunity to grow their sales in some way. That being said, not every brand will have a huge opportunity in Google. For some, 80% of their sales might come from Google and 20% might come from other channels. But for others, maybe only 5% will come from Google. It really varies and I find that the more visual the product, the less likely it will do well on Google. So if it's like something highly visual, like clothing, for example, unless you're selling like Nike shoes or well-known brands on Google, you're probably not going to do fantastic. But if you're selling like a solution to a problem, like you've got a product and it solves like back pain, people are gonna be searching. There's so many searches for like pain management, back pain, how to heal my back pain, how to fix my back pain. You're missing on all of those people there. 
if you're not on Google. Yeah, wow, you've got me thinking, man. So I've, I've got SaaS software, mm -hmm. if people don't know what that is. It's, it's not a huge sales bill right now, but yeah, I've, I've been trying to sell our SaaS and I'm like, man, Google just doesn't work, but I'm pretty sure it does. I'm pretty sure I don't work. I don't know how I'll make it work. So we well, might have to have a chat about that later. <laughs> Again, it comes down to putting yourself in the shoes of people that are searching for your solution. They might be searching for things like, how do I increase my average order value or, so, or something like that? And yeah. then you've then got to craft an ad that gets their attention and take them to a page that is going to get them to convert. So. The other good thing with Google is you, you can get people at all stages of the buying cycle. Like you can get the people that are, I'm ready to buy right now. And they're obviously a small portion, but you've also got people that are like, they're aware of the problem. And then you got the people that are totally not aware of the problem. Like they might just be searching how to start a Shopify store or Shopify store or whatever it might be like really top of funnel stuff. Yeah. And the other factor with Google is that people forget that you can remarket across all of the Google channels. So yeah, yeah. at the very least you should, if you're getting traffic from SEO, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, wherever, you should be remarketing to people on all of Google's channels because like even Google's display network, that covers 90 something percent of the internet. Like it's a huge amount of websites. Wow, that's huge, man. Is there any low hanging fruit every brand should do to start if they haven't done anything yet? I think you kind of just touched on it just before what you were about yeah, to say. Definitely. I think the most important thing is like having your Google Analytics set up and actually going in there, digging into it. Because like I, I say Google Analytics goes hand in hand with Google Ads. So you can get some really, really high level analytics. So go in there, utilize it, have a look at which pages have a really high bounce rate, which pages have slow load times, things like that. Like you can utilize that on the ad side. Bidding on your own brand name is super important. And I know that some people are against it because they're like, that's my brand name. I already rank highly. But if you think about it logically, if you're not doing it, then you're missing out on the shopping tab if you've got products because your brand name can come up in the shopping tab. So your products will come up bang. If you're not doing that and you're not remarketing to people at all, then that whole space is gonna get taken up by someone else. So even if you rank organically, you might be at the bottom of the page on a phone. Do you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, great. You rank really high organically for your own brand name, but people can't even see your listing. Do you know what wow. I mean? So you may as well at least have your merchant center hooked up and even just having the free listings pop up. So your free Google shopping listings. Then I would also add a text ad with your brand name. So then you've got the next listing. And so realistically between your shopping ad in the industry, it's called like a branded search campaign. It's basically where you're bidding just on your own brand name, nothing else. And your ad is literally your store name, official store and takes you to homepage, bestsellers, something like that. Underneath that, you're going to have your organic listing. So you're taking up like, I'm sure someone's worked it out, but like how valuable is that first page on Google? If you can occupy like three quarters of it, why wouldn't you? And it's like for relatively an inexpensive amount of money as well. Is it actually like really cheap to just bid on your own stuff? On your own brand name. I would imagine like, it would be. I was just looking at a client's account, like their return on ad spend on their branded search campaign is like 250, 300 X. Okay. Wow. And they're an account that spends like 260,000 Aussie dollars a month on Google. And they spend two to three grand on their branded search. So 1% of their ad budget goes on branded search hmm. and they make a huge ROI. They might make seven, 800, $900,000 a month just on that. And yeah, some of that would have gone into SEO, right? I'm not saying all of those sales, but like your competitor can go and bid on your brand name if you don't do that. So you may as well get in there for a very small amount of money take control of that real estate and not give it up to a competitor because people do do that. People, there's, it's not illegal to bid on someone else's brand name. You can't use it in your ad copy, but you can bid on it. Okay. All right. So step one, bid on your own keywords on your own brand. What's step two for a newbie? Step, step two, set, have your free shopping listings set up. So you can actually connect your merchant center. And if you've got a Shopify store, the Google shopping sales channel will do all this. Like it, yep. a few clicks, it's done. You've got a merchant center account. And then on the free listings, which are, if you go to the shopping tab, the listings that are below the paid ones, they're the free listings on Google shopping. So they're like more SEO. So with that, you obviously want to have good titles and descriptions in your product titles for the shopping feed so that Google knows 
what your product is and when to show it. And on that, the Google product category which you assign, like if you're selling like a camera, make sure you've got it listed under Google's product category for cameras. So Google 100% knows what you're selling. Yeah. That would be step two, have those free listings set up. Optimize all your listings and everything. Okay, yep. cool. Can we talk about, so search ads, right? So mm -hmm. this is this is someone who's just searching for back pain or something like that. How yes. do we get people to click our ads and make them profitable when they're looking for back pain? I just don't know how to do it. Is there a certain way to write? Is there a certain way to think? You talked about it before. You got to think yeah. about what the, the searcher is thinking. Yes. To me, I'm just coming from like, interruption world like direct response mm -hmm. marketing stop the scroll but i just yeah. don't think it's the right way to approach because it's never worked for me look for e-commerce most of your sales will come from that branded search campaign if you're driving a lot of traffic from elsewhere like from instagram facebook and stuff like that. so that's where like search ads are important but most of your sales for an e-commerce business are going to come through those google shopping ads which are the images up the top that's where most of the sales are going to come from for an e-commerce store. For something like a SaaS business, obviously you can't be there, so you yeah. will come up on other channels. That is the most important bit is making sure all those Google shopping listings are like very good. The image is the most important thing. So okay. you need to make sure that the image is accurate. It's easy to understand because I think people don't put the time in and actually go, hold on, this image is going to be like this big on a mobile. Is the person actually going to know what I'm selling or are they going to get confused? And does my listing stick out compared to other people's? Okay. Because if it's the exact same thing, the exact same image of AliExpress or something like that, and everyone else is cheaper than you, well, then who, who are people going to buy from? Do you know what I mean? Like you don't necessarily have to compete on price, but your product needs to look different, better. Ideally, you want it to look more premium if you're trying to sell it for more money. But price is a really big factor on okay. Google Shop. Really, really big. Because I can imagine, like you've typed in back pain or something, and then there's yeah. all these products that popped up to help with back pain. Yeah. Straight away, all I'm looking at, there's like stars as well. There's star, yeah. there's yeah. pricing, and there's a yeah. picture. Is yeah. there other things we can do to get people to click on it more? Or is it literally those three things we need to focus on and make sure that we're differentiating? Yeah with there's two sides to optimization for because really what we're talking about is google ads optimization now first you've got to rewind and go what campaigns do i want to start and you've really got two options for the shopping ads and really everything in general you've got the new performance max campaigns which came out last year from memory and they're the quickest way to kind of get up and running and be across all of google's platforms in one campaign so a performance max campaign will get you on google shopping Google search, display, discovery, and YouTube. So it'll get you across everything in wow. one campaign. So for most people, it's probably gonna be the easiest thing to get up and running. There's some downsides to it, which I can get into later, because you do give up a lot of control. And if you don't have much conversion data, like when people used to talk of seasoning a pixel, if you don't have any conversion data, Google doesn't really know what you're selling and who your buyers are. So at the start, if you don't let it run long enough, and if you haven't optimized your titles, your descriptions, and have good images, you might find you don't get a lot of success with Performance Max, particularly if you go in and change things all the time. Yeah. If you decide to go the other route and just have standard shopping campaigns, you have a bit more control. You can add negative keywords. So if you see you're appearing for keywords that are irrelevant, like if you're doing back pain and you're coming up for knee pain, then your product isn't suitable for it, right? You don't want to come up for that. But Google will probably show you for searches like knee pain or pain and things like that. So you kind of lose that control with Performance Max. That said, it's still a really good option because it will get all your remarketing up in that one campaign as well. As long as you've got audiences properly set up and you do have dynamic remarketing turned on, yep. you can. you would have probably seen like, maybe you're looking at the Australian Financial Review or news.com and you see like those products pop out on the side, that's like a dynamic shopping campaign on the display network. And they work? They're really good for brand awareness and they're very good at keeping you front of mind. They don't get a lot of upfront sales those, but they get a lot of what's called like view through conversion. So like assisted conversion. So they definitely help, but you can also remarket on shopping only. So you can make sure that you're 
product listings come up to people that are already on your remarketing audiences. So if someone like sees your Facebook ad, they jump onto your website, they don't buy, they're now on our remarketing audience for Google likely as well, if they're signed into a Google platform like Gmail, Chrome, anything like that. If they're not, obviously, and Google can't track them, they're not going to be on that. But then, say they start to search back pain, like they've gone, oh, this looks like a cool product. I'm going to start searching back pain, back pain relief products, things like that. Oh, they're on the remarketing list, your products appear. So you can see how if you start thinking about it like that, you can actually do quite a lot because then you can also go, okay, now show them a Gmail ad as well and now show them a search ad. So these people start searching and you're kind of following them absolutely everywhere. They go on YouTube, they see a YouTube ad. You kind of get them in this web and some of those don't get a lot of upfront sales, I'll be honest, but they help through that process to turning them into a buyer. Yeah, okay, cool. In like other platforms that I've worked with, I know myself that I'm like, there's no point trying this, 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 turn that off, turn that off, turn that off. Yep. What's the Google ads version of that? I would say for most people, if you're going to go to performance max, let the thing run for a couple of months and just touch nothing. How much would you spend on that? So is this like something you need to spend a heck of a lot for, or is it like a small, small budgety kind of idea? There's two things. So if you're in a really competitive space, it's, it might be tough. So if it's super, super competitive and you're selling something that's generic, you probably, one, it's going to be hard regardless of what marketing method you use. That's probably going to take even more time for Google to find a buyer. But realistically, I would say that 20 to $50 a day, you can still get some results, which isn't a big amount of money. And like, I personally don't like doing anything sub 50. I prefer 100 plus. But I know that some people can't or won't or don't have the budget to do it. So if you re let something run on, say, $30 a day and you let it run for two or three months, and if you have everything set up properly, you've got remarketing audiences, you've set the campaign up properly, like everything is good and it, and it doesn't look ugly because in Google, when you're setting these campaigns up, it does show you what it will look like. And you really need to look at it because I think people just type things in, like they'll type words, okay, I'm selling this, it looks cool. And then if you actually go and look at their ad and say, you don't, you don't sell that at all. Like what, why did you write that in? Oh, people might be interested in it. It's like, you've got to be specific. That's another key thing, like specific and accurate. That's something I was going to talk about as well. Like, it's not like a thumb scroll. It's like a, no, we have the exact answer specific. Yes. Is that kind of the way you think about it too? Those are the people that are like more bottom and middle of funnel for sure. I mean, you still get the occasional persons. Look, I'm in a lot of back pain. We keep using this back pain example and I'm just looking for something. I don't know what I want. I'm looking at foam rollers. I'm looking at this vibrating, this massage guns. I don't know what I need. You'll find a lot of them will actually buy multiple things. Like they might buy a massage gun and then they'll buy a foam roller. They might buy all of them. So if your product is at least up there competing with people, you will get some sales and they are like becoming profitable. That can take time. Like I find people, once they get to the three month mark, if they're not really seeing any sales or really, really bad, you can improve it. But for most people, that three to four month mark, I think once you get there, if you've actually given it a good crack, then it could be tricky. But definitely at the six month mark, if you've done it, you'll know. We talked about it before, like p competitors targeting us, like our mm. own, our name, our keywords. Is it a good idea to do the same thing, to fight back? But it depends on the industry. If someone is actually looking for something, I don't know, someone's looking to buy a Toyota Hilux, it's tricky because they're probably sold on that. But that yep. said, maybe they're considering the Ford Ranger. Do you know what I mean? So Ford Ranger bidding on Toyota Hilux probably isn't a bad idea. If someone's looking for something and it's that's the only thing, I don't know, there might be a title of a book and you sell a similar book, but that person's typed that title, you're probably not going to do well. So I think it's a case by case. Mm. I've seen it work really well for some businesses and really poorly for others. So I think for most people, give it a crack. Be tasteful about it though. If you go and use their brand name or defame them or something like that, you're probably gonna run into some issues. You can get like cease and desist letters and stuff like that if you aren't careful. I've seen businesses like Slack can do it really well or like competitors of Slack, they might go, you know, the best communications tool or something. You know what I mean? Like they'll stick it to someone else. You can do well. I think- They're it, a bit cheeky. Or, their brands yeah. are quite cheeky in themselves. Yeah. Part of the product, I guess. Yeah. Case by case, I think most people could give it a crack. 
Is there any point doing things like more lead generation or should you be going for the sale when it comes to e-commerce? So lead generation is in, I don't know, a giveaway, a digital product or anything mm. like that. Me personally, I'm a big fan for Google of getting that sale. I know some people do really, really well with that lead gen side. And I think you can do well if you've got that back end awesome and you're really good at converting I don't know if I'd call it low quality traffic, but lower quality traffic into buyers. If you're good at that, then go for it. But like I've just found, particularly if I'm managing other clients' money, if I go to them with a strategy where I'm like, I'm going to spend your money and I might get you a few leads and you're not going to get any sales, it's a really hard sell. I've found that if I can get them a sale straight away, you can then build those more higher hanging fruit into the budget and just start off small and build on them. Mm. This is e-com specific for like lead gen, and other businesses, then totally you can do more stuff like that. But I think for e-com, your best bet is to try and go for that sale. Yeah, okay. And then another thing I've thought about as well is how do you scale? When I see Google, I'm like, okay, like it doesn't quite to look to me like a platform I can scale on. So once I crack it, it's well, I've already cracked it. I'm in all the ad spaces. I can just lift the budget a little bit. I normally, I would think you wouldn't be able to lift it too much. That's my own thoughts. I think, again, it depends on your industry, depends what you're selling. For some, you're 100% right. Some stuff, you hit that ceiling really quickly. Most things, though, I find, you'd be surprised how far you can push it because you'd be surprised how like mind-boggling large the number of searches for particular things are. And then even if you use, like you can sanity check this in Google's own tool, the Google Keyword Planner. Okay. So you've got a tool, you can put in the keywords, say you're selling back pain product, whatever, back pain relief, whatever it might be. Now that search term isn't exactly what you're selling. So you're gonna to have to take, if it says there's 70,000 searches a month, awesome. That doesn't mean you've got 70,000 buyers either though, because that person might buy something else. They might be looking for a cream. There's so many things, but there's multiple ways you can scale on Google. The easiest is increasing that budget for the most people. But doing it really slowly, if you do it really fast, what happens with Google is like your return on ad spend just goes and falls off a cliff. Yeah. So really slow. And when I say slow, the slower the better, to be honest. Yeah. Like you can't do it too slow, really. But the same token is not being scared to increase that. Because I find some people hit a ceiling, they're profitable. They want to make more sales, but they don't want to increase that budget. So it's, then you have the, I guess, changing that mindset of, well, you actually probably do need to increase that that budget, anything that's not performing, you want to just get rid of out of your campaigns in Google. If it's genuinely not performing, just get rid of it, stop spending money on it and focus on the things that are working. On the same token, what most people will find is their Google shopping ads will kind of maybe show 20, 30, 40% of their products and the whole rest of your feed gets nothing. Like it doesn't get seen. So you then need to split that out and put it into another campaign so it actually gets some attention. So that's another way, that, that never ending splitting, you might have to do that five, six, seven, ten 10 times to actually get your product seen. Yeah, wow. So that's another okay. way. And then it's like, you also wanna be across all those platforms. When you add all of those things in, you'd be surprised how scalable a lot of businesses are. That said, I do find the businesses I've seen have the most success are ones that do sell more than one or two, three products. So Google, to me, is better suited to some to a business that has multiple products. Catalogs. And especially yeah, versus a one product or two product sort of scenario. That said though, you can still get all your remarketing up, you can still get some sales, and you'd actually be surprised. If it's something that's solving like a massive problem, or if it's like something like the Udi, which has huge search volume, like that would be making, you know, millions of dollars in sales on Google, for example. Yeah, totally. With scaling up your budget, are you scaling just your budget? What are you touching when it comes to like cost per click and ads budgets and things like that? Do you mess with that kind of thing? When you're first starting out, you talked about performance max campaigns too. Do yeah. you even touch any of the cost per click or? Most of Google's strategies now are like the bidding is you kind of leave it up to Google for the most part. There are some accounts where I'll still play with it for certain things. One area I will still play with it is bidding on your own brand name. Okay, yeah. If you leave bidding on your own brand name to Google, what it'll do is over time, your cost per acquisition will keep climbing. 
because Google will just keep increasing it. <laughs> so you just got to keep it low. Sneaky buggers. They are. <laughs> they do really <laughs> sneaky. And then they always I... tell you to, for that campaign to actually use maximize conversion value or maximize conversions. And over time, you just end up paying more and more for your own brand name. So that's not ideal, but that's an okay. easy way to get around it. You go manual. But for yep. example, with Performance Max, you're letting Google optimize for max conversion value. So Google will keep going out. And that's why it's important to have conversion tracking set up, tracking the value. Because once it sends that data back to Google, if it doesn't have that value, then well, what's it going to optimize for? It really will keep trying to find more and more people that are spending more and more. And so that bidding, you just leave it. When you do get a bit more advanced, you can play around with a setting called target ROAS. So like you might have one campaign with a target ROAS set to 300%. So a three X return on investment on, on ad spend. And then you might put your best sellers in at 250 because you want to be more aggressive. So when you lower that target return on ad spend, Google will bid more aggressively on those products. Okay. Wow. And also when it comes to scaling as well, when you say scale slowly, how much percentage wise should I, I be increasing my ad budget and when should I be doing it every week, every day? I think for most people, a weekly change would be good for most. And I would say it would depend on what they're spending. If they're spending like 20 or 30, they can be more aggressive. You know what I mean? If you're spending 20 or 30, you can jump up to 40 or 50 pretty quickly and not worry. But if you're spending a thousand, then you don't want to jump up to 2000 or 3000 a day very quickly. So it kind of depends what stage you're at. But I think for most people, you know, 10%, 20% would be the absolute max. I would change it. Yeah. Um, and it also depends if they've got a target row as set, it doesn't matter so much because Google will try and hit that target return on ad spend. So you can be more aggressive if you have a target row as set but a beginner probably will not have one or I don't recommend they do because there's just not enough data for Google to actually work out a good target ROAS. You can't work it out. There's just not enough information there. Cool. That's kind of leading into what I was going to say next is the tracking thing. You talked about tracking a little while ago, just before we touched it briefly. How is Google handling this whole tracking world now? I can see that they've yeah. got this new Google Annex 4 thing that's kind of freaking everyone out. I have no idea what that is, and I'm supposed to change over to it. I actually have no idea what the heck I'm supposed to do there. <laughs> like I told you before, I'm definitely not a tracking expert. I know the basics of it and the change to Google Analytics 4. I'm doing the same thing. I'm transitioning across. Unfortunately, Shopify kind of looks like it does work. I've not seen it work 100% within the Google sales channel. There's quite a few apps at the moment that are letting you do that transition, but I'm actually, I'm working on putting together a video on YouTube to show people how to do it. Right. Um, easiest way is to just use a third party app through the Shopify app store. There's quite a few, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but there's heaps. If you go into the app store and go Google Analytics 4, yep. it will do it and it will set up. And I've actually seen a lot of them seem to, they're pretty good. So to answer your original question though, I think Google has much better tracking than Facebook for the most part, but it is not perfect. It's still okay. not perfect. But like when you use something like a Hyros or one of those other third party apps, I find that the discrepancy between what Google reports and what Hyros, for example, is saying versus what Facebook versus Hyros, there's a much, much bigger difference with Facebook versus Google. Like Google might have a 10% difference where Facebook yeah. might be 40% or something. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah, that's just my personal experience. Someone might come out, some tracking expert and go, no, Google's tracking is rubbish too. But my experience has been that it is better, but not yeah. perfect. Yeah, I imagine it would be because you're also keeping within the browsers and things like that too. You're not switching exactly. between browsers from Facebook over to... yes your website or whatever Shopify is trying to do deals with Facebook to try and keep everything within the Facebook yeah. world to help with all this tracking and everything. But yeah, Google, I would imagine if you're searching on Google, well, you're still within the browser, you're still within Chrome or whatever. Yeah. So they should be able to track a lot more. Yeah. yeah. Cause a lot of people yeah. sign into Gmail too. And they don't realize, you know, through Gmail, they can track you as well. Gmail. Hang on. How does that work? So you're, when you say you sign into Gmail, it's your Chrome browser is signed into your Google account. Is that what it is? Well, I think there's people that aren't using Chrome that are on Gmail as well though. So I don't know if that's a hundred, I think that's for most people the case, 
but I know there's some people that will use Gmail on their phone, for example, or their workplace mm. uses Gmail and you're signed in there, then they're still able to track you through that. Or YouTube, for example, as well. YouTube's another platform for... And before I forget, that's actually another area that's new for Google is YouTube short ads are another yeah, area. Yeah, I was going to talk about that too, yeah. Kind of launched. Yeah, so YouTube shorts is another area. But look, on the tracking stuff, it's bloody complicated. I don't think anyone has fully solved it. I don't even know if it is 100% solvable. No. I don't think it is because I think it's, it's impossible to say because what if someone sees your billboard ad and then goes and... Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's ever going to be 100% accurate. So what I tend to do is... I try to look at like a holistic picture. What does the Shopify dashboard actually the total number say? Because quite often, mm. you know, Facebook might have a really bad return on ad spend, but quite often it's feeding your other ad channels as well. If you stop running those ads, and I've seen clients do it, they're like, well, our Facebook ads aren't profitable. Our Google ones aren't. Let's stop the Facebook. And then all of a sudden, oh no, Google's tanked. Mm. Because they kind of feed each other because, you know, people will see your ad, then they'll start searching about you or they'll search about your back pain problem or whatever it might be. So they both feed each other. And I think if you don't look at it holistically, tracking, no tracking, you're gonna miss out on sales. And I know it's not a perfect art form and everyone wants, oh, on this day I spent $1,000 and I made 5,000, but it just doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. Yeah, not anymore. It did a little bit more, more back yeah. in the day when I worked for another company. So we were turning over 10 mil plus, whatever, in yeah. sales every year and I was spending upwards of 100, 150 grand on Facebook ads and stuff. Yeah. There was always like this clash between, there was an agency running Google for them. Right. And I was doing yeah. like kind of in-housey kind of stuff for Facebook, okay. sorry for that company, but they still, I was still held accountable as if I was kind of an agency, my own self doing my thing. Yeah, right. yeah. And it would just every now and then it would be like a, Google, a Google report versus the Facebook report. And we'd be yeah. fighting each other. I'm like, yeah, but we need to spend yeah. more. Yeah. But the ROAS yeah. isn't right there. So I've got to try and convince yeah. them. And they're like, why is Google doing so much better? I'm like, well, it's different. And I'm like, we, and like, you got to think about over a long time, I'm spending 150 grand. They're spending like 20 or like 10. Yeah. So like I'm scaling oh, yeah. the business and it, I know the ROAS yeah. is here. I can't yeah. get that same ROAS, but we can actually, it's feeding each other exactly like what you were saying. 100% feeding each other. And to be yeah. honest, I think Google ad agencies are really, really good at showing a blended number and not splitting out their branded return on ad spend versus their cold return on ad spend. Because if, yeah. if people did that, they then get a much different picture. So I when like you say that, what are you talking about? This is something I wanted to get into. What do we need to be looking yeah. out for when we're trying to hire an agency? It's tricky with Performance Max because Performance Max becomes a bit of a black box. But I still think that if an agency doesn't explain to you that Performance Max is a bit of a black box and it's including like remarketing, your branded search terms, all that into one campaign, it's really easy for me. Say someone comes to me and they're getting a three times return on ad spend and they're not doing Performance Max and they're doing other things and it's just cold traffic and they're not doing any branded. I can come in and look like God by running some branded traffic ads with Performance Max and then you know the ROAS looks great. But then the moment you try and scale that, it just goes, yeah. So there's a lot of things. I think I think for the most part is like, is the person good to work with is probably the most important because they could be the greatest ad manager in the world. But if you can't work with them, it's going to be very tricky to develop a good long term business relationship. So I think that is probably the biggest one. Watch out for the agencies that have like lots of sales staff. I've got nothing against people that are sales staff. But a lot of the agencies employ 95% sales staff and then very few people that actually know anything about Google. And so when it actually comes to running your account, the salesperson promised you the world, the ad manager goes, well, that's not even possible. Why did he promise you that? Wow. So there's a really big disconnect between the person you speak to when you sign up versus mm. the person that actually ends up managing your ads. And that's probably why I've struggled to scale my business because I've struggled to find good people to do that. And I've always just been so hands-on, which obviously limits my ability because one, I hate sales. You know what I mean? I like the, the leads that come to me, they want to work with me because they've seen my content. There's someone else they know has worked with me or they've just seen me around online and they, they know I know about Google. I don't think I'm the greatest person in Google on the planet. Do you know what I mean? I'm pretty consistent. I know a lot about it, but I'm sure there's lots of people that really nerd out, but they might be really difficult to work with. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, you, you need to marry those two together. It's a relationship. 
that you're building. It's, just, it's a relationship. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you can over-optimize things as well. Do you know what I mean? You mm. can get too into the detail and try and split this out and that out and you end up with a worse result. So it's like, you also need to marry up. Is this actually worth changing? And quite often I'm more convincing people to just leave things be and don't touch them rather yeah. than go and change a bunch of things. You've got a ton of YouTube videos on all of this stuff. So if anyone wants to dive in themselves, definitely just go in and watch all he talked about. Nick did just a performance max one versus yeah. I don't know what it was. What's the other term? Oh, Pmax. Pmax. I don't. Know. I don't really know. I, I just know you did a video just recently on performance max versus something. Oh, performance max <laughs> versus standard shopping. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like most of my stuff is on the nerdier end of YouTube yeah. content. It's not. Oh, spend a dollar and make seventy six million. It's not that stuff. It's like quite detailed. Yeah. More boring. You know, it's not. It's definitely not exciting stuff. But it's stuff that I do day to day that I know works. And if people just followed it, I probably wouldn't even have a business, but most people yeah. just can't follow it, don't have the patience, don't have the time, and they just go, I'd rather you do it in that instance. Yeah. So, I mean, if you've got the time, you've got the patience, just there's, there's other good YouTube channels out there as well. There's yeah. heaps of good content, take it with a grain of salt, but if someone's promising like an amazing result with minimal effort and time, it's probably BS. <laughs> I love that says every single guru in the world. I wanted to talk to you quickly as well about YouTube. So yeah. to me, that's a whole different ball game. YouTube, I don't know what they're called, but like just YouTube video ads or thumb ads, yeah. like when you're yeah. watching a video. Yeah. So, YouTube ads, yeah. yeah. Yeah, YouTube ads, not just like the shopping ones that just appear or whatever underneath yeah. stuff or yeah. on the display or yeah. on the side. I'm talking about the actual yeah. YouTube video. Do you have yeah. many businesses that are crushing with it? And no. yeah, how are they doing it? Has anyone, I've done it with big businesses who have yeah. spent big budgets on trying to pull off yeah. like a, almost like a TV commercial or whatever, and yeah, never seen it work. Well, I think TV commercials did the same. I don't think TV commercials for the most part in the last like 20, 30 years actually delivered a good ROI. I okay. think they've always been no. a brand awareness piece that I think they're still good. I don't think they they will ever form a huge part of most people's budget unless they've got a big brand awareness budget. I have seen some ads do really, really well, get quite a few conversions, but those have taken like a lot of time, a lot of budget. And I find that you just constantly are just trying to narrow in on who the right buyer is on there. But the creative okay. is super important. If the offer isn't super appealing for someone to, if I don't go and buy it now, I'm going to miss out. If it's not that sort of a thing, then no one's going to stop watching their YouTube video and go and buy what you've got. What I find yeah. with YouTube ads is if you're running them, your shopping ads improve, your search ads improve, and all the other areas improve with it. I don't find that they result in a lot of direct profitable sales, but they do result in really good brand awareness and in view through conversions. And in some instances, if you're selling something and it's in demand and you've got a good offer in place, then yeah, but I don't know anyone that is absolutely crushing it. I've never been able to get it to absolute crush myself either. I've got hopes for YouTube shorts being a bit better because I guess it's just more of that format that- TikTok-y kind you know, of. People are used to anyway. like, yeah, like sort of like your, your Instagram reels, Facebook reels and your TikTok sort of style ads. So I've got hopes that that will do better, but I also just, I don't think people for the most part on YouTube are there to buy stuff. They're normally there researching something. So again, good for the awareness piece. And I think people just get the shits as well with, I just want to skip this ad. So unless you've gotten their attention, just bang, they're probably going to skip it. Yeah. They're normally like all the self, like all the gurus that basically are just going They must hard. do well on there though, because they're obviously yeah. spending money. Like those Tony Robbins and things like all that sort of style thing, I think must do well on there. I mean, I myself have never seen, I've seen one e-commerce brand do okay. But again, their shopping ads were bringing in most of their sales and stuff like that. Like it was doing okay. Yeah. Well, that's good feedback because I just thought I was failing trying to do all that stuff. And like working with this other brand, I was like, man, how do we get this to work? Obviously, someone's figured this out and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of, I don't know anyone and I've spoken to a lot of people that's like absolutely killing it in that space. I've heard a lot of people say they're killing it for like a couple of months or whatever, and then they disappear and they're doing something new. So I don't okay. think they were actually killing it at any point. <laughs> Is there any magic that we should be adding to our Google ads right now? Like any secret, like Nick Armanis 
figure like I've figured something out kind of thing, or is it just just do no. the basics really well just and do get the basics? Yeah, do the basics and do it for a long period of time. Like just yep. don't run something and then give up because it's. I think people just have a really unrealistic expectation of any form of advertising. They think that you know they're going to run some ads, they're going to make some money tomorrow, and everything's going to be happy, and they'll just keep increasing the budget and they'll keep making more money. Just like a constant small incremental changes over time and then just letting that algorithm do its thing because it does work it works slowly and as long as you have everything set up in place correctly to begin with you should do well all the stuff that i said it's no there's nothing that's like out of anyone's reach anyone with a computer can pull it off so i would say just just give it a go yeah awesome okay man the other thing i wanted to talk to about is shopify and youtube doing anything mm -hmm. i've heard that they are there's some new stuff that is in the works or is coming out now can you open that is up it for like us? The, the the shoppable part is that what they were talking about yeah like i've just heard there's like new things that shopify is kind of starting to bring out i don't know what they are i'm just kind of taking a stab out there i've heard it in the I'm rumor sure. mill i think the only thing i can think of would be that just i think what shopify is trying to do with google a lot is just make it easier for entry level advertisers to get their products up on those platforms in some way yeah that isn't technically difficult because that is, i will say that's one downside to google is nothing's really that straightforward of okay i press this then this then this it's like, okay i've got to have this account and this account and then i've got to link them all together and then i've got to get this thing over here where i think shopify is just kind of okay here you go press a button and your products are up in some way I think what they're doing there is they're utilizing like a shopping listing and then getting it seen on those product style ads underneath videos. They might have a video option. I don't use it because I don't like, I don't use a lot of those instant tools. I kind of get into the ad manager and ads editor a bit more. I think most people just need to kind of just be aware of what's available there. I think a lot of people don't even know that Google owns YouTube, for example. Do you know what I mean? Like they could, they might not have known that you can get your ads there or how easy it is to get some Google shopping ads or performance max campaigns up and running and just start off small and build on it. Talk to me about Bing. Does it matter? Yeah. So the cool thing with Microsoft Bing ads, I think it's called Microsoft ads now. They've become popular now because of chat GPT, because they've integrated chat GPT into Bing. So I'm interested to see where that goes. I don't really have anything to tell you about that part yet, just because it's just so new, but it'll be interesting to see how search advertising changes with these chat GPT style yep. searches. But that's why I think a lot of people have gotten interest in the last few months around Microsoft ads. I mean, I've been running them for many years. What I like doing with them is they've got this feature where you just import everything you're doing on Google into Microsoft ads. And it's literally just a few clicks and you can import it across and you don't really have to spend too much time. It's good to still go in there and optimize it. But for the most part, if you didn't want to, you can just scale everything down on Bing because you're probably only going to get like maximum 10, five or 10% of the search volume that you do on Google. So it's just an easy way to just get a bit more sales. I will say like products that are targeting older audiences, they tend to do quite well on Bing because you know older people don't go and get Chrome, for example, you know, or they don't use Google. And so Bing, Microsoft ads is the automatic search browser. engine that gets used. The auto yeah, browser and search engine. So oh, I've never thought about that on yeah, PCs. So, yeah, so on PCs, every, every, you know, and a lot of workplaces as well. Yeah. Have Bing as the main and Microsoft Edge as the, the, the main browser. Yeah. Wow, I've never even thought about still that. shopping on there. You know, you can still do shopping ads, search ads, all of that. Wow. What do you think is going to happen with AI? Where are we going? Where's the search engine optimizer? This is going to shake up that space, I think. Well, for sure. Um, I think, I think what will happen is ad styles will be different. The way you manage ads will be slightly different. But I mean, Google's been using AI for years. Like Google's algorithm is AI. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. Patience and taking time to let it do its thing. And then making sure that conversion tracking is set up that you're feeding it good data. I mean, that's been happening for quite some time. In terms of how people search, you're already seeing voice searches is a new thing, relatively new that people search more voice. They just structure sentences differently. I don't know, I mean, feeds are going. That's one big thing that will change with Google Ads. So it'll just literally scrape your 
metadata, your website code to find out what you're selling. So your Shopify code. So that'll be a big change. I'm pretty sure this will happen this year or next year. So you won't have those feeds that are a separate thing to manage. Wow. That'll be one big change. But in terms of, it's hard to say, man. It's, I imagine it will change a lot of things. I don't know exactly how. I know people will search differently. So potentially your product titles will have to be structured differently. Maybe you'll need different metadata lying underneath there to work out what, what's someone going to search? What are they searching? Chat GPT, how do I fix my back pain? And then maybe some shopping listings will pop up. Yeah. You know I, mean? I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, to be perfectly honest with you. There's probably so much that will change. And I think it'll just, I don't know, maybe it's overdone too and it'll change very little or it'll take longer. I don't know. I think it will catch on pretty quick because I find myself using Chat GPT for a lot of things. But I'm interested to see how these businesses monetize it because there'll be ads on it for sure. Yeah, it's... there has to be. I've researched so much. It, it is kind of yeah. frustrating that it can't research right now, like in 2023. You can't yes. get too many yes. suggestions right now. And I'm yes. sure it's because of this whole advertising factor is one part of it. It's like they want to figure out how to monetize sure. the current what's in the market. What's the five best chairs for posture or whatever yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. There needs yeah. to be some kind of ad more. How do you rank at the top of that answer? Yeah. Well, I think, I think most of the time in a lot of these businesses, sales velocity ends up being the main factor. So it's like, for example, in Google shopping, the number one listing a lot of the time is the person that's selling the most. Really? Well, Amazon's algorithm works the same. So it works on sales velocity. So whoever's selling the most in a period of time will get preferential treatment. Okay. So it could be one way. Just makes me think, hey, where are we going? <laughs> what are we doing there? <laughs> Is it replacing us as digital marketers? I don't think so. Quite eventually. I think it's going to be a tool like any other. I think initially it will probably create more work as in like more opportunity for people that use it. And then longer term, probably it will just take over certain things and maybe we'll be doing something different. I don't know. I mean, this isn't the first time technology's come but this is the scariest, I'd say. Yeah. I do encourage e-commerce businesses to play, to just play with this stuff. Play with ChatGBT. Don't keep yourself out of the loop because things will be coming marketing-wise. And you will have, this is like an opportunity. Every time there's a new platform, every time there's something new, the first people to it in your industry, it's a, it's a quick way to rise to the top mm -hmm. in like a, I guess a niche that might be hard to compete with these big guys who have been around forever. Yeah, yeah. Like even stuff like that, like you're, you're selling sleepwear, clothing or whatever. If you're trying to compete with these guys, they're crushing it right now. But if you can yeah. jump onto the next trend mm -hmm. before anyone else is jumping onto it, you can crush it. So yeah, I just encourage everyone to have a play with that. Well, there's a lot of efficiencies that a lot of businesses are going to get out of it, I think. So Definitely. that will be one thing that will help. If we can reduce costs in admin or customer service or anything like that. I mean, you could ask chat GPT, I've got this customer complaint. Can you come up with a script to keep the customer happy, you know, and then just make templates out of it, like stuff like that. And I'm sure you can plug that into an Excel sheet that'll just like auto generate stuff. There's so many things you can do with it. What are you using it for in your business at the moment? I'm just playing around with it, to be honest. Like I've tried things like write a better product title for this product, emphasizing, you know, I think a lot of people forget you can be quite detailed with it. You're like, I want to emphasize the purple color and the contour design. You know what I mean? Like you can go okay, can you elaborate on that title? Can you make it sound in a more casual tone? Can you make it sound in a more professional tone? That's not even that detailed. So I've seen some people get so detailed in things that they're asking it to do. If I'm unsure of how to respond to a certain situation because I'm like super blunt and a lot of people don't like it. So I'll go, can you rewrite this email in a less blunt fashion? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Write this less blunt. That, that'll be stuff that I'll use it for. Or if I'm doing a YouTube video, hey, can you, I think you can actually link videos and it will look at the video and come up with a product title. So I can go, hey, I've got this YouTube video, link to video, write a good title and description for it. Yep. Or write a Facebook post or a social media post. I've played this. around with a lot of these yeah. things. Yeah, it's good fun. I The other thing I think a lot of people don't realize, there's another one that's kind of cool, a prompt that's assume the identity of this. So I'd say like a digital marketer who's been working yeah. in this space of blah, 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 who has an expert background in blah, blah. So I'll, I'll try and describe myself as a, in words and then I'll say, write this blog. Also take note of these 10 things. These are the top 10 ways 
these two, blah, blah, blah. So you can get like really detailed, yeah, you can, take note yeah. of this and then write a blog about this. And it's really yeah. natural because it takes all of the knowledge and it takes the writing style of that kind of person in industry. But you can do that with your products as well. If you're selling like aromatherapy or whatever, it's assume the identity of an aromatherapist who yeah. is an expert in XYZ, who's been working in this industry and is a quirky, fun, easy to understand person. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. There's some really cool stuff that you can play with. I find that also like you need to tell it what tense to write into because I find that it will often not write it in the tense you want. Okay. So you'll have to go write this in the first person or third person or whatever you want to put in. I find it always seems to get a bit clunky with that. Or well, not always. It sometimes can be clunky with that. Yeah. I found that confusing. Too. Yeah. So you go, okay, rewrite that in the first person tense or something like that. Cool. So if people want to get in contact with you, Nick, how do they do this? What And what can you provide and what type of business yeah, might sure. want to work with you. I'm able to cater to most people in some aspects. So I think most beginners, the best place for them would be to go through my YouTube content or through my Facebook group. So the YouTube content will teach them the basics of most of the stuff they need to know. Yes, it will involve you having to use the search bar a little bit, which I know a lot of people sometimes struggle with. So as long as you can use that YouTube search bar and you're willing to go through those videos, there's playlists and stuff like that. So there's heaps of stuff there. You can definitely educate yourself with that and then start looking for other YouTube content for free. And then if you need to ask questions, just join the Facebook group. I can't even remember what it's called now. You, you touted it off before. Google ads for e-commerce. I'll have a link somewhere. <laughs> it's such a long bloody name. I don't even know it myself. So you can ask questions in there. And then in terms of how I can help people, most of the time, the businesses that come to me are either already getting traffic through Facebook, Instagram, SEO, and they want to keep scaling through another channel being Google, or they're already running Google ads and they want to scale those Google ads further, optimize them. Those are the businesses I tend to work more with just because brand new businesses, it's a lot harder for me to add value quickly while they're also paying for me and paying for their ads and they're not getting a return yet. So I think for most people that are fall into that boat, your best bet is to get something up get some sales through the door, and then you can engage an agency or something like that. And the way to get in contact with me, you can either go through YouTube, the Facebook group, or through rmenacedigital.com and just hit the contact button, submit a request, and we'll come through. I've also, every single video I've got on YouTube has like my little questionnaire there if you want to work with me, and you can just fill that out. Great. What kind of budgets would someone want to be starting with if they were going to be kind of working with an agency or with someone like yourself? I think for most people, if they're not spending a hundred bucks a day, it's probably going to be pretty hard to build in the cost of an agency. Yeah. So I think if they're spending under a hundred, even a hundred, I think for a lot of agencies will be tough. I think it's manageable as long as they're willing to stick to it longer term. Yeah. Because a lot of my, I tend to partner with people like long term. And the way I'll do that is I might take a percent of the revenue I generate or something like that rather than charging fees upfront. But it really depends on the client. And if they're able to do that and want to, I just find that it aligns us better if we work like that. So yeah, around that hundred plus dollar mark is where I think most people would need to be to contact any agency. All right, cool. Thanks for that, man. I've had an awesome download and just a good chin wag. <laughs> Awesome, man. <laughs> I hope some people get some value out of this. If if you have got any value out of this, or even if you haven't, click the like button and subscribe, of course. Or leave us a review or do whatever. I don't know what platform you're listening to this on, but do the thing that helps us do the things. Thank you very much, guys, and see you next time. See you guys.